title of this talk is Boundaries. Uh, this is the only one word talk title at this conference, which I'm very proud of. The next shortest is three words. Thank you. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, some of the stuff in this talk is going to be very familiar to anyone who comes from certain functional programming backgrounds, but um, this is a story of me approaching some ideas that they have from a very different direction and from a very different history. So uh, I am Gary Bernhardt. I look like, look like this on the internet, where sometimes I get mad. And uh, my Bluetooth is not working very well. I might have to forego it. I own a company called Destroy All Software that produces screencasts on various advanced software development topics. And to start us off in this talk, we're going to, to start with test doubles. Uh, there are a couple talks about test doubles, mocking and stubbing at this conference. This is not a talk about test doubles, but they are going to be part of my motivation. Uh, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, let's go through a quick example of what an isolated unit test might look like. I have a sweeper class. This is in some kind of recurring billing situation, and if I have a user who is subscribed but has not paid in the last month, I want to tell him that something's wrong and, and disable his access. So uh, when, a when a subscription is expired, uh, we will make a user, Bob, he's going to be a stub, he's an active user, and he last paid two months ago. We will have an array of users that's just Bob for convenience, and before every test, we're going to stub out the user.all method to return that array of Bob. Uh, so this is one of the ways in which we're isolating ourselves from third parties, from other classes like user. We want to email the user when the subscription is expired, so we will uh, invoke the sweeper, and we expect it to call usermailer.billingproblem to send an email to this user telling him things are bad. So this is an isolated unit test. It's isolated because it removes its dependencies like user and like the user mailer. Hopefully my phone is back now. Awesome. Okay, uh, the implementation of this is very simple. We will uh, pull out all the users from the database. We will select only the ones who are active users but have not paid recently enough. And then for each of those, we will send the email, right? So very straightforward stuff. What we have here is a three-class system. These three classes uh, integrate in production, but in test, we're removing two of the dependencies, replacing them with stubs and mocks, giving us this as our testing world. So everything is nice and isolated. <coughs> there are uh, several good reasons to do this, several very big benefits that come out of it, but there's also one really terrible thing that happens when you do this. So let's go through those. This allows you to do real test-driven design. Uh, looking at your test, seeing that you have mocked six things and two of them are mocked three method calls deep, this tells you that your design is not so good for this class. So it gives you a form of feedback that you can't get without isolated tests, at least I don't know how to. It allows you to do outside in TDD, where you actually build the higher level pieces before the low level pieces exist. So we could TDD the sweeper using the user, using the user mailer before those classes exist because we're just stubbing them out anyway. Then when we want to write the user class for real, we can look at what we stubbed and that tells us the interfaces it needs. And finally, this gives you very fast tests. This is uh, one of the main things in the whole fast rails tests meme, or I don't want to call it a movement, but people getting excited about fast tests in the rails world. Uh, and we're talking about the difference between a 200 millisecond time from hitting return to seeing the prompt back uh, versus a 30 second time to run a very small test. It's a very big difference when you're, when you're really isolating. So these are all very good things that you want, but they are balanced out by a very bad thing. And that bad thing is that in test, you're running against a mock and a stub, and in production, you're running against real classes. And if you don't stub the boundary correctly, your test will pass and your production system will be wrong. Uh, and this is this is such a big problem that for most people, I think, it overshadows all those benefits. Uh, even if you explain them to them, they're going to look at this problem and say it's not worth it. Right. Now, there have been attempts to fix this. Uh, various, various approaches to try to solve this problem in one way or another. One of which is to solve it with more testing. Uh, contract and collaboration tests. This is an idea uh, sort of uh, mo most closely associated with J.B. Rainsberger, who is uh, one of the people who was most influential on my understanding of isolated unit testing. I've not actually done this, and uh, something about it doesn't resonate well with me, but it is one attempt to fix this. There's also the tools approach. Uh, RSpec Fire is a tool in Ruby that, that tries to solve this problem. If you mock a class in R with RSpec Fire, it will 
uh, make sure that you only mock methods that actually exist. So and make sure that you don't cause these boundary problems, or at least you don't cause simple boundary problems. And finally, you can solve this with static typing like so many things in life. Uh, it comes with all the same costs you pay to solve anything with a powerful static type system. But if you think about your mocks as being subclasses of the real class that just remove all the actual implementations, that gives you an idea of how static typing can solve this boundary problem. All of these only solve simple kinescence mismatches between objects. They solve things like, I called the method with the wrong name, like passed the wrong number of arguments. They don't solve deeper things like, my two algorithms that need to cooperate don't actually cooperate correctly. The way that you can solve that, and the, the most common way people try to fix this problem is by just not doing isolated unit testing, by just integrating, right? Um, the problem with solving the isolation problem with integration is that integration tests are a scam. Um, I, I can't take, take credit for this sentence. This is, once again, J.B. Rainsberger. Uh, there's a talk called Integration Tests Are a Scam, which you should all watch. It's a really good talk that really lays out the argument for why integration testing doesn't work on a long enough time scale. And he nowadays uses the terminology integrated test to mean any test that's integrating multiple pieces. I'll give you the really quick and dirty argument for why integration tests don't work. The number of paths through your program goes like 2 to the n, where n is the number of branches or conditionals. And that includes try except, that includes a short circuiting Boolean expression, that includes uh, a loop. Every time a branch is happening, uh, if you have n of those, you have 2 to the n paths. And if you're trying to test the whole thing, you have a space of 2 to the n to, decide, to choose from. If you have 500 conditionals in your program, this is a number with about 150 digits in it. Uh, it's a very large space, and it's very difficult to effectively choose which, which paths matter, because they're effectively uncountable to you. The other problem is that suite runtime in an integration suite is super linear. Whenever you add a unit test or uh, whatever kind of test you're writing, you're also adding a little bit of code. So your number of tests goes up by one, and you make the system a little bit bigger, which means all your existing integration tests get a little bit slower. So every time you add a test, there are two sources of slowness, one of which is linear and one of which is something else I'm not sure of. But together, it's definitely a super linear runtime. And uh, anyone who has a three-hour Rails test suite will be able to tell you that this is, in fact, the case. Uh, and they will probably not like their lives very much either. So that's all background. This is, this is how I came to the ideas of this, the, the, that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk. This, was, uh, this has been a large focus in my software development career for the last five, five years, is uh, isolated testing and figuring out how to do it well. So now let's shift gears entirely and talk about values. Uh, values meaning the, the uh, pieces of data inside of a program. If you want to test the plus method, and let's just think about plus on machine integers, and for whatever reason you decide you want to test it in isolation, so you don't want any de other dependencies involved in the testing, what do you have to do to isolate plus? Nothing. Right? It isolates for free. Uh, plus doesn't have any dependencies. There's nothing to mock out. There's nothing to stub. It's uh, totally local. And why is that the case? Uh, it's not just because plus, whoops, it's not just because plus is simple. Uh, it's, it's tempting to say, oh, plus is simple, so of course it isolates for free. That is not what's happening. It has two properties that are necessary to be naturally isolated with no stubs or mocks. The first is that it takes values as arguments and it returns new values. And it doesn't mutate those values, it just gives you a new value, right? It takes an integer and an integer and it gives you an integer. The second property is that it doesn't have any dependencies. There's nothing to mock. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't need anything else. It's a local computation that just produces a new value. So how could we apply that to more complex code that we work with all the time, stuff like the sweeper? Well, let's go through this and just impose both of these constraints and see what happens. Starting with the bob stub, we can't use a stub because we're not faking out any boundaries. So let's replace that with a user object, but not like an active record object, but like just a struct, some kind of, a, a piece of data. Even a hash, I wouldn't use a hash, but you could just use a hash. We can't do the, the user.all stub because we're not allowed to, so we'll just delete that. And then the actual body of the test, instead of doing a mock expectation, we can just call the method and get back the array of users who are expired. Now, this does less than the original code, but we're going to get to that later. Uh, the, the implementation changes. We basically lose the second half. We now have a method that goes through all the users and returns only the expired ones. This difference 
is huge. The difference between the original code and this is huge. The, the nature of the communication between the components has changed. Instead of having synchronous method calls as the boundaries between things, we now have values as boundaries. The value returned or taken by the method is the boundary between it and another object. Um, now, just as a quick digression, when I talk about values, uh, I, I often mean things like this, maybe, a class that is a struct. It has two fields, title and body, and it has a slug computed from the title. But behaviorally, this is equivalent to a class that has a title, body, and slug, and computes the slug at creation time. They're basically the same thing. Right? The only way to tell the difference from the outside is timing properties on the method calls. So I'm going to use these two ideas interchangeably, but really, they're basically the same. So we've seen uh, isolated testing as a bit of background. The idea of converting the code in the system to communicate via values at the boundaries instead of via message sends or method calls at the boundaries. And now I want to look at how this fits into the three dominant programming paradigms, uh, putting aside logic programming. But how does this relate to procedural OO and functional programming? Here's a small piece of procedural code. We want to feed some walruses. So for each of the walruses, we shovel some food into its stomach. We shovel some cheese into the walrus's stomach. There are two properties of this code that make it very obvious that it's procedural. The first is the each. Whenever you see each in Ruby, there's something destructive going on. Each, each with a, with a non-destructive body is a no-op. So there's something destructive happening, and we know the structure of the walrus and the structure of its stomach. We know it has a stomach. We know the stomach can have things shoveled into it. We have knowledge of the internals. Contrast this with the OO solution, where you still have an each. It's still destructive in most OO code. But now we tell the walrus to eat something. He knows how to eat, instead of us knowing about his stomach. And then the eat method will shovel things into the stomach. Same code as before, just encapsulated. Uh, and my Bluetooth is dying again. So we have two, two paradigms here. Both of them involve mutation. One of them separates data and code. That's procedural. One of them combines them into units called objects. If we add functional to this, instead of doing an each, we do a map. We're going to take all the walruses and produce new walruses that are slightly different. So for each of them, we're going to call eat on the walrus and some food, some cheese. And I'm going to use a hash for the walrus, an array for the stomach, and strings for the food. So in the eat function, it's kind of weird, but we build a new stomach that's the old stomach plus the new food, and then we build, <laughs> we build a new walrus that's the old walrus with the new stomach. Um, you can see why OO models real world things a little better than functional programming does. <laughs> OK, so that's, so that's functional. Uh, nothing is being mutated, right? So we have no mutation, but data and code are separate. They are not combined into single things. Now, if you look at this, at this table, obviously I've left a row. There's one more row to go. But even just looking at the variables, we have two variables. Does it mutate or not? Does it bind data and code together or not? They clearly vary independently, which means we have four possibilities. So what is the fourth possibility? Uh, it's not logic programming, by the way. Uh, here's what the fourth, po fourth possibility looks like. We map, like in functional programming, so we're producing new walruses, but we're telling the walrus to eat something. And that's not a destructive eat. Instead, the eat method constructs a new walrus that is the old walrus with a new stomach that contains the new food. So it combines the immutability of the functional code, but it combines the merging of data and code together like OO does. And that is the fourth entry, and I call it lovingly faux O because it's not real OO. Now, there's a problem with programming this way, and that problem is that you lose the ability to do anything destructive, to talk to network, to talk to disk, to do any kind of I.O. Uh, you lose the ability to maintain state over time. So, to, to reintroduce the idea of state, we have to add imperative programming back into this sort of faux O style of programming. We have to figure out how to compose the user database, the expired users class, and the mailer uh, together, even though the expired users class is functional in nature. So we have our, our, our expired users. It returns a, an array of users who we need to notify. And what we need to do is reintroduce the imperative layer around it, an imperative shell that surrounds the functional core it talks to the database, it uses expired users to filter those users, and then it emails each of the ones that comes out. So the imperative shell is a layer that surrounds the functional core. The functional core is the bulk of the application. It has all the intelligence. 
And the imperative shell is sort of a glue layer between the functional pieces of the system and the nasty external world of disks and networks and other things that fail and are slow. Uh, if, we, if we look at what's actually happening in these two things, it's not an arbitrary distinction. Even though all I did was cut the original method in half, this division runs very deep. If you look at what these things do, the expired users class makes all the decisions. And the sweeper class has all the dependencies. So if we look at uh, the way that that relates to testing, the functional core is heavy on paths, heavy on decisions, light on dependencies, which is exactly what unit testing is good at, especially isolated unit testing. When you take away the need to stub out the dependencies, you can just focus on the logic and the tests become very simple. And exactly the same thing is true for the shell. Lots of dependencies, few paths, is exactly what an integration test is good at. It, because it makes sure all the boundaries are lining up, all the pieces are communicating correctly, but you don't have a lot of test cases, which means you don't end up with a 30-minute or a three-hour test suite. Uh, just to get a sense of what that integration test might look like, since we already saw the unit test, maybe I create two users in the database, actually create them in an actual database. I invoke the sweeper. I pull out all the mails that were delivered by Action Mailer, and I make sure that only Alice was mailed. She's the only one who's expired here. She paid two months ago. Bob paid yesterday. But I only have to write one of these, whereas I'm going to have to write a bunch of the isolated tests on the functional core. So now we have a, a solution to the isolation problem in, for most code in the system, because we can build it all as functional pieces in this sort of FOO style where there are still objects, but they're not mutating, and they're just taking values in and out. And we have a way to reintroduce the imperative part around it so we can actually talk to the outside world. And it turns out that this leads to all kinds of amazing benefits, not just the testing benefit, not just the fact that functional code is easier to reason about over time, but it even makes certain types of concurrency much easier. Uh, if we think about the actor model of concurrency, which is the one that I have the most faith in as something sort of approaching a general purpose concurrency style or concurrency uh, programming method, uh, let me quickly explain it to you just in case everyone's not familiar. I'm going to do it with just threads and queues. So we have a queue, and this is going to be the communication mechanism between two processes. It is the inbox of process two. Process one is going to send to it. For process one, I'm just going to fork off a thread that is going to infinitely loop reading from standard in and pushing into the queue. Process two is going to infinitely loop reading from the queue and writing to standard out. So this is an echo program that's communicating through a queue where the queue is the inbox for process two. If I just run this at the shell and start typing things into it, it's just going to print out whatever I sent in. This is the, the simplest way I know to explain the actor model. You have independent processes. Each of them has an inbox that is only readable by that process, and they communicate by sending messages to each other uh, into each other's inboxes. The, reason, the way that this uh, relates back to functional core imperative shell, to FOO, to the idea of having lots of values, is that every value in your system is a potential message, a possible message between two processes. Every value that is struct-like and can be easily serialized can also be easily sent over the wire. And this is a special case of the value is the boundary between the components. So if we rewrite our sweeper in a slightly different way, so we have a sweep method. It calls expired users on user.all, so it pulls everything out of, the data, out of the database, finds only the expired ones, and then for each of those emails, this is the imperative shell that you're looking at right now. The functional core is the expired users class. It's going to do what it did before, or the ex expired users method, excuse me. It's just going to filter out expired users. And then we have this very trivial notify of billing problem thing that just delegates to the mailer. Let's translate this into the actor model. Uh, for the first one, I'm going to make an actor that pulls everything out of the database and just sends them one by one into the expired user's actor and then dies. If I didn't do die, then this would loop infinitely. The expired user's actor is just going to pop a user off of its inbox. It's going to decide whether that user is late, and if it is late, it's going to forward that user on to the mailer uh, process. And the mailer process is just going to invoke the mailer. So the uh, imperative shell is sort of a, a, a bigger process. It takes a little while to run. It fires off all these messages to the smaller processes. And what we've just done is converted a program that could only use one core into a program that can use three cores, uh, not on MRI, but on other VMs. <laughs> Uh, we've, we've 
parallelize this by doing very little work because we had the values available to send over the wire. Uh, oh, I forgot to actually translate that. There's the new version. It's the same thing as the old, basically. Values in your system afford shifting process boundaries, but really, in general, values in your system afford shifting boundaries between anything, between uh, class arrangement, between uh, subsystem arrangement, between the way that you're building your program, whether it's serial or, par or parallel. Um, so this has, uh, programming in this, in this style has surprisingly deep effects on the things you can do and the way that you can do them. That was a lot of stuff, so now I'm going to try to re-say it in like three minutes to, to make it all tie together. Um, in this style, you design your program as a core of independent functional pieces that take values and return values. The imperative shell orchestrates the relationships between those, uh, interfaces them to the network, the disk, other nasty systems like that, and maintains state. Uh, for example, I wrote a Twitter client in this style. Uh, it's sort of a, it's a terminal program, but it's interactive like Vim would be. So you hit J to go down to the next tweet. The uh, imperative shell sees the J, calls into the functional core to generate a new cursor position. The new cursor is generated and returned, and then the imperative shell updates the instance variable holding the cursor to be the new cursor. The functional core built the new cursor, and it was a purely functional operation. The imperative shell just updates references to these new objects as they're constructed. What you get from this is easy testing, especially isolated. You also get easy integration testing, and the distinction between which one happens where is a lot more obvious than it is if you just start throwing things against the wall and try to figure out what gets tested how later. You get fast tests. You don't have to do any weird stuff to get fast tests. They're just inherently fast because they're functional and working on small pieces of code. You have no call boundary risks. You don't have to stub or mock. You have easier concurrency, at least in the actor model, and you have a more fluid transition between concurrent and serial computation. And that's all just a special case of having higher code mobility in general, moving code between components, moving code between processes. Uh, so that is uh, the end of the actual talk. Once again, I'm Gary Bernhardt. I run Destroy All Software, which produces screencasts. And if you are a subscriber or want to become one, uh, it is not free, but there is a screencast on Destroy All Software called Functional Core Imperative Shell, which is the first time I ever talked about this in public. And the one that's coming out um, two weeks from now is also about this topic, expand a, a little more. And in that screencast, I give a much larger example that I can't really give here, but I show you the Twitter client and how it's arranged and how, uh, how the, the different parts of the system are segregated in, in this way. So with that, uh, thank you guys very much for listening to me for half an hour. That actually went way faster than I expected. So um, I would be happy to, to take comments or questions or, yeah. Do you think there's any uh, useful distinctions besides the functional bit between like a, a, a ports and adapters architecture? Right, that's a wonderful question. Uh, the question is about uh, port, the relationship to ports and adapters, right, or, or hexagonal architecture or, or these kinds of things. Um, yeah, so uh, if you're building a, a large system that's going to be 30,000 lines of code, you don't want to have one functional core and one imperative shell. Um, if you ask a Haskell programmer about doing this, they will tell you that, that it just becomes a nightmare. I think that the, the, the ideal large system is actually many smaller systems built out of this, in this sort of way. You, you have the functional pieces, you wrap them in a layer of scar tissue to interface them to the nasty outside world, and then you build a bunch of those that communicate in destructive ways. Is it, does that answer the question? Um, sure. <laughs> There's no adapter in that explanation, but it's sort of... The adapters are the scar tissue. Yeah, exactly. That's true. I guess, yeah, to some extent, the, the, the imperative shell is just a, an adapter. Um, fair, fair observation. Yeah, over on the side. How have you found uh, success in using the active model of the right now? What libraries and techniques are you using? The, the question is, how have I, ha how have I find, found success in, in using actors with Ruby? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> um, I have, uh, so this, this Twitter client that I, that I wrote to, um, as I was figuring this out, 
does use the actor model, but it's just threads and queues. I, I just built a little actor library. It's like 35 lines of code. Um, a simple actor library is easy. A more complex one, um, I see diminishing returns if your VM isn't built for it. You can't spawn uh, half a million processes in Ruby. Your machine's just going to go up, uh, explode into smoke. So um, use Erlang. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm curious to know if you've run into a lot of resistance in trying to use this paradigm and bring in other gems and libraries at the same time. Like, uh, let's say a traditional Rails app. Right. Like, how suited would a Rails app be to this paradigm? The, so the question is, how suited would a Rails app be to this style of development? Um, the answer, once again, is no. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it's not going to work very well. Um, you could, I mean, it depends on how large your Rails app is. The thing about a Rails app is if your Rails app has 100,000 lines, you don't have a Rails app. You have 95,000 lines of your application, and you have 5,000 lines of Rails glue code. And probably what you've done is dumped those 95,000 lines into models, controllers, and helpers, uh, and failed to actually design your system. If you had designed a system and treated Rails as a small component of it that you want to mostly protect yourself from, then you might be able to do this. But um, to be honest, I've, I've never even thought hard about how you would do that. Uh, I, I guarantee it's possible, but, but you're not going to transition your large Rails app into this easily. I guess just really quick one response to that would be like, we do leverage a lot of previously written software that helps us a lot. And what you're proposing then really is a pretty dramatic uh, overhaul. Of, of, you, know, you can't leverage quite as much, much as you maybe could. You, I, mm, if, it, with, with the imperative shell wrapped around the functional core, you, you can do whatever you want out there, right? So you can use, I mean, like my, my, Twitter, my Twitter client uses all tons of gems, well, not tons. It uses like six or eight gems, uh, normal gems that are just, you know, work like anything else. And they're, they're imperative in nature as OO programs and Ruby programs tend to be. And I just uh, put them out in the scar tissue layer and I let that be as big as it needs to be to reasonably allow me to use it. And then... Uh, in, the, in the functional core, it doesn't, it doesn't have to see any of that stuff. Um, it is, uh, this, is exact, this is the difference between just thinking about that sort of faux O style of programming, the functional OO style, and then actually adding the imperative shell. The imperative shell is what allows you to build real software that actually does work uh, in this way. Yeah, I'm uh, So when you gave the functional example, you know, you create new walruses and return and write walruses um, in sort of a true functional standpoint, right? You just return data, not objects. Um, so sure. how do you feel about like going to the next level? Like, you know, there's nothing special about a walrus that has a stomach. All animals have stomachs. So if you just return data with a stomach key, it's under full empty. And so, you know, like, how do you feel about going to the next level? I guess is what I'm saying. Going even more functional, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the last sentence. Uh, going even more functional, I guess. Like, oh, okay. functional. Um, well, I wouldn't consider changing from returning walruses to returning stomachs as more functional. Um, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying oh. returning a stomach key. Like a data structure that is the animal with a stomach key that's out of full empty. Right, right. So returning a data structure as opposed to a data structure full of objects. Right. Um, well, if you look at the code, I, I use the word walrus, but really there's nothing especially walrusy about the code. You could replace that with animal. Uh, and it, it wouldn't know the difference, right? It just knows that there is a stomach key and there is. Uh, inside of the stomach is, is an array of, of various foods. So it's not tied to the, to the walrus nature of the walrus. So you're finding the, the, the user as a walrus, right? You're, the, the, the class of the walrus is not an animal, right? I mean, I know it's an um, example. Well, no, I never mentioned a walrus class. I could have used the word animal, and it would have been the same thing, right? As long as it, as long as it has a stomach, that code will work on it. I just used walrus to make it more concrete. Okay, but my point was, how do you feel about going, just returning data? If the values are the data, then, like, if your values are boundaries, then how about just return data instead of objects? Um, objects are data. If, they're, if all, if all the, the methods on an object are pure functions, then the object is data, and it's indistinguishable from an object, that, a struct, that has everything early bound, right? Late, late binding, only matters in a, uh, in a system with mutation in it. This is why, for example, Haskell is lazy. Well, Haskell's weird. Um, 
yeah, I don't know how else to say that. <laughs> I feel like I'm failing to understand some part of your question. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, you're going to have to choose not to mutate things, and like you call merge and then return the half of the more intuitive would be sure to do that. Might have been used the squares operator off the hash instance, or you may have to call dot dot on an array. Right. Or sometimes so it would feel awkward. Yeah, so, well, if, you go, if we go back to the place where I actually did that, where I merged, it's way back here, there it is. Um, this was actually the functional example, right? If you look at the, the functional OO example, I just did wallers.new, which is a little more natural. There's not an easy way to say I want a new object with only this field changed because Ruby's not designed for that, but that is easier to build in than it would be to build in, to replace all your core types. Um, the nice thing about the Ruby core types is that the, the really scary things have bangs on them, usually, the mutation. Um, it's not true for like delete, but, but the names are usually very obvious that they're mutating or they have a bang on them. I've actually not found a problem uh, maintaining, um, maintaining functional uh, data structure manipulation code in, in Ruby. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> yeah, in the back. So my question is, Kind of created a class function operator that found all the expired users. And so you find that your functional core thing gets layered with a whole bunch of these, and it just makes it harder to follow exactly what your app is doing as you move through different algorithms and different pieces. Uh, it certainly could. You have to spend, uh, what I've found is that the, the choice of which classes you have in the core is extremely important. The names of them and the, the, the way that the responsibilities are divided up. So actually, I could pull up part of the Twitter client and show you guys a larger example. Um, let's see. Uh, wait, where am I? Yep. So for example, the cursor, cursor, this is, one of, this is a piece of the functional core. It has state that includes the tweets in a list of tweets, and then selection is the currently selected tweet. Right, so this encapsulates all the behavior of the cursor. And actually, why is my keyboard not working? Um, part of, some of this is gross. Like, it's actually quite a large class. This is one of the largest classes I, I've written since I started programming Ruby. It's almost 100 lines. But that's because it's really like a very small module. I know, dude laughs. Uh, it's like a very small module of, of functional code that's just sort of self-contained. And then if we look at the actual uh, imperative shell, this is the entire shell. It's 153 lines. Is that what that says? Can you guys read that? There. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so let's see. Where uh, cursor dot something with tweets? No. Starting at index. The shell is sometimes a little bit awkward. Here we go. So here is the cursor actually being manipulated. When you hit J, it just reassigns the current cursor in the shell to the result of doing cursor dot down. And if we look at cursor dot down, all it does is construct a new cursor. So the fact that I chose cursor to be one of the boundaries in the functional core is very important. If I had, had, if I had a tweet list and then was maintaining a selection separate from that, this would have been awful. It's very important to find those boundaries that make uh, very small, cohesive functional components, but not too small. I mean, I showed you like three line examples in the talk, but that's because it's a talk. Uh, really, you want pieces larger than that, but smaller than a whole subsystem. Does that answer your question at all? That was Chuck, right? Yeah. yeah. I can't see, but I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it kind of answers the question. Okay. I think I would just have to dig in and kind of play with it a little bit more and figure out what makes a good boundary and what doesn't. Yeah, that's the hard part. I mean, that's always the hard part, right? But um, separating, separating things that do mutation from things that don't gives you a starting point. And I, it's the best starting point I've found. It's not an absolute rule, but if you start there as opposed to some other arbitrary rule, I found much better results for design. Uh, other questions? There is no library. <laughs> uh, the, the Twitter client is not online because I stopped working on it because it turned out that Twitter, Twitter's evilness is growing much like test runtime of, of an integration suite. <laughs> and I, I lost confidence that I should build software that interacts with it. Sorry, Twitter employees. I assume there's some here. But, um, yeah, so no, none of it's on. Sorry? Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. At least it scales. OK, sorry. <laughs>
creating a bunch of new objects. Wow. Have you seen any performance implications of that? Because you're like discarding a ton as well. Yeah, I mean the the Twitter client um, doesn't really have many performance concerns. I mean it does. When it comes up, it's sorting through thousands of tweets. It remembers everything all the way back. And so it has to do a merge of like what it has versus what it sees from the API. But it's not doing anything really big. Um, in, in MRI, your life may not be especially good if you're doing tons and tons of allocation. If you're in the JVM, it's much better. right? And if you're in a VM that's designed to have constant object creation and destruction, it's going to be even better than that. And a VM designed for functional programming. I would guess that the Erlang VM would would handle this very well, for example, because in Erlang, you're constantly making small objects and letting them be freed. So yes, um, doing, doing this on, the, on, on MRI, if you have performance concerns, is probably going to be a little difficult. But you can do certain types of caching, right? If everything's a value and immutable, you can always cache things, because they don't change. So there's, there are ways, there are ways to, to work around the, the unfortunate nature of your VM. I saw a hand back there. Yeah. Yeah. What's the what's the biggest thing you've built using this style? And you know, do you, do you have any concerns that as it gets big, uh, the ability to organize the code is going to suffer? Um, both good questions. What's the biggest thing I built, and and do I have concerns about scaling this into larger projects? The biggest thing I built is the Twitter client. It's not that big. It's about 600 lines. Um, and I would not be up here talking about this if that were why I thought this is good. The reason I think that this is good is that it, 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 has, uh, it has shades of both the actor model built into it, the, the idea of functional pieces that are communicating by passing values back and forth. And it also is a lot like the Haskell idea of using the IO monad to encapsulate state, which is a wonderful idea that scales wonderfully up to about 500 lines of code, and then everything falls apart. right? Um, you look at a 20,000 line Haskell program that does a lot of I.O. and you're not going to like life. Th this is why I say I think that the a larger program is, is smaller ones built in this way communicating via, via channels external to the process. But um, what I'm really trying to do is merge, merge this idea of actors, merge this idea of the I.O. monad, and bring them into the O.O. world using our terminology. Right? I didn't talk about monads. Uh, I, I only talked about actors at the end as an example. Um, I'm trying to re rephrase that stuff and terminology that we use so that it, that it seems more directly accessible. Um, but to get back to your question about, about larger systems, um, some of the largest, most, well, some of the most reliable large systems in the world are written in Erlang. And probably, probably most of the reliable large systems in the world are written, written in Erlang. Um, lots, of, lots and lots of nines. Uh, not, not like Twitter's three nines. We're talking about like eight nines, right? Um, and the fact that they can build large systems that are that reliable using the actor model, even not even knowing what those words mean, tells you that there's something there, right? So that was a long-winded answer to a very simple question. <laughs> yeah? I wonder um, if there's an approach that you might recommend if one were creating a new Rails app, and let's say they were creating a user model that was subclassing active record base. Is there an approach that one might take to try to experiment with the with the techniques you're talking about to try to isolate. Right. Um, well, sorry. Uh, if, if, if you're building a new Rails uh, application and you're doing things like you have a, a user that subclasses active record base, um, how, do you, how do you go about doing this? Um, I haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, I have opinions about how you should be building that application, but they don't involve this. Um, that's a different talk called uh, deconstructing the framework. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not clear to me yet. Give me, give me a year or two. <laughs> Others? Yeah. How do you deal with the case where the abstraction starts to leak? So for an example would be in the sweeper. Mm -hmm. You're passing a user dot all. Mm -hmm. But it turns out the database is really fast at doing the filtering that, that the, uh, the expiration thing is doing. Yep. One of the reasons that my talks tend to take half as long as when I practice is I forget to give all the qualifications. Like, for example, uh, you don't want to actually do that, right? You don't want to call, call user.all and then filter it in, in Ruby. Um, the, most of the complexity of your application is not database querying, right? I mean, um, there's, there's plenty of querying in a complex app, but, but it is not the 50% of your application. It's a fairly small percentage. And I think that probably, uh, the, if, you're using a, if you're using Postgres or MySQL or, or SQLite, that goes in the shell. If you're using something like Datomic, uh, 
which is a database where everything is immutable, uh, that can go in the functional core, right? You, it's just data structures. Data, Datomic is just data structures. So it depends on the nature of your database, and the more your, your components are designed to work in this way, the more can move into the core, but it doesn't mean that pieces, it doesn't mean you can't do this if you have Postgres. It just means Postgres has to be relegated to the scar tissue, which I think is fine. 80% uh, functional is a heck of a lot better than 0%. You don't have to get to 99%. Yeah, front row. Um, how do you look at functional language as long as training? Um, what keeps you in Ruby, especially for functional? What keeps me in Ruby? Um, uh, inertia to a small extent. Also, I just don't like any of those languages. <laughs> um, I, I, I have this, this problem where I can't, I can't not care about syntax. Um, I really like syntax. and. Uh, I've, I've written, I wrote a lot of Lisp in college, and I just never really enjoyed it that much. Uh, Python and Ruby are, are what I like syntactically. Um, this is why I want to go cru live on a cruise ship and write a new language. Um, how are we doing on time? It is 3.10. Um, we can do a couple more, I guess. Yeah? Do you see a way for us to fix these problems? Ways to fix these problems. Um, Contribute to Rubinius for about a year until you know how it works, and then fork the Ruby language. Um, I'll tell you how to do it. I mean, <laughs> you want persistent core types, right? You, wanna, you, you want uh, core types that are designed to be used in this way. And from that, most of this will fall out pretty, pretty naturally. Um, you probably want actors and lightweight processes, and you're going to have to build a user land scheduler, but it's not that hard. That's what Erlang has. And if you have a user land scheduler uh, with lightweight processes, if you can fork 10,000, 100,000 processes easily and you have immutable core types, you're most of the way towards doing this 99% uh, of the time or 95% of the time. Yeah, back right. I already sort of asked the question before, but as someone who uh, is very well acquainted with evil Twitter and the Twitter API specifically, um, I would still encourage you to open source this, even if it doesn't execute, just as an example of um, this style. Yeah. The question is, why won't you answer my question? <laughs> um, no, that's legitimate. I do, I do plan on, on, uh, on putting this up eventually, even though I kind of am not happy about Twitter. I, just, I, I struggle with the idea of encouraging people to write software that interacts with something I don't like versus demonstrating something that I think is good. So, yeah. Also, it's a little bit embarrassing. Like, the, the shell is not actually tested at all. There are zero tests around it, even though it's 150 lines long, which I think will give people the wrong idea. I mean, I have reasons that I did that, but, but they're very hard to articulate in, like, a readme that anyone will actually read. So I'm a little torn about encouraging bad things. Yeah, middle right. Yeah. Uh, I think that this is a little bit more of a meta question, but um, since I'm interested in a lot of your ideas here, I just, I'm wondering if you look at array languages and their approaches to concurrency right. versus um, thinking about things at the thread level. And I'm wondering, because I kind of think the whole idea of working at threads is just too low level for the long, far flung future of concurrency. I'm just wondering what your opinions are on that. Right. So the question is, have I looked at array languages and, and dude believes that thinking explicitly about threads, or I assume you mean processes as well, like any kind of explicit yeah, thread of control. Yeah, thinking about those explicitly is, n is not the, the, the right long-term thing. Um, the, first, the first answer is no, so that's easy. I've, I, I mean, I'm familiar with like J and all those languages. I don't actually know any of them. Um, I've seen small snippets, but I don't understand them. Uh, the, to, the, the second part about threads and arrays, or threads and, and processes not being the right primitive, I guess would be the word, right? The right primitive to build on. Um, I'm not convinced that that's actually true. I'm not, I'm not convinced that they're the wrong thing. Uh, I assume the alternative you're thinking of is, is things like a parallel map, right? Like, like implicit parallelism. Uh, that it, you're still writing sequential programs that just have parallel pockets, whereas in the actor model, everything is inherently parallel. I mean, if, if it's even remotely reasonably decomposed, right? As long as you don't have one process that's doing a ton of work. Um, so I'm, I'm, not told, I'm not convinced that, that, uh, that threads and processes are wrong. Well, I'm convinced that threads are wrong if you're sharing a state, but I'm not convinced that uh, independent threads of control, independent uh, processes of control are the wrong thing. Yeah. Have you thought about writing your Twitter application using a more open protocol like post status? Uh, 
um, writing the Twitter app against a more open protocol, uh, like OStatus? Uh, I guess I could. Um, doesn't sound very interesting. That's the problem. <laughs> I, <laughs> I already wrote it once. I don't want to write it again. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll put it on GitHub, and I'll accept pull requests that, that put it on a more open protocol. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, uh, that, it is time. Thank you guys very much.